Good evening. As president of the Medford Historical Society and Museum, one of the sponsors of this meeting, along with the Friends of the Medford Public Library and the Partnership for Historic Bostons, I'd like to welcome everyone to this virtual event. Medford was founded in 1630, making it one of the oldest English settlements in North America. Our rich history mirrors much of American history, including an agricultural phase with a large plantation worked by enslaved Africans, and an industrial phase with enterprises such as shipbuilding, rum distilling, and brick making. In the 20th century, we transitioned to a suburban city and now share Tufts University with our neighbor Somerville. Our historical society and museum dates back to 1896, making this our 125th year. We are dedicated to building community through a shared appreciation of our diverse history. The Partnership of the Historic Bostons Incorporated is a nonprofit history study group celebrating their 20th year this year. The partnership interests are in exploring and seeking to understand the Puritan period of early New England with particular focus on the early history of Boston. The partnership also actively commemorates our origins in England and particularly our heritage in Boston, Lincolnshire, where several of the Bay Colony's early leaders came from. The partnership's main history offerings are in the fall, September and October, when the Charter Day Lecture Series commemorates the September 7, 1630 establishment and naming of the towns of Boston, Dorchester and Watertown. Bedford must be in there somewhere too. Um, the organization also conducts a suite of themed walking tours, reading groups, and other events, including presentation the two colonies by partnership trustee Stephen Kenny is presented in conjunction with our Medford Historical Society and Friends of the Library. Now it's time to turn the microphone over to John Morrison, president of the partnership. Thank you, and thank Professor Stephen Kenny for this presentation. Hi. Hello, I am John Morrison. I am president of the Partnership of the Historic Bostons, which was founded 20 years ago with the uh, idea that it should be possible to understand and explain Puritan New England on its own terms and in contemporary terms, and at the same time to commemorate and celebrate our history in England, and particularly in Boston and Lincolnshire, where many of the early leaders came from. I am proud and pleased to be able to present Stephen Kennedy, Kennedy as our primary lecturer, first lecture, uh, lecture for today. And Stephen is a board member and a trustee of the partnership and has been so for very many years. His original P PhD is from Boston University, he went to Quincy College where he went from faculty administrator to interim president, then to the Commonwealth Museum where in one year he went from starter to being the director. The museum, its purpose is to tell the stories of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It does that in many, many ways, all of which are extraordinary. Before, before COVID, there were school groups who visited on a regular basis and they got to see the ex whatever exhibit was there and the treasurer's gallery, the treasures, treasury gallery, treasury gallery being the gallery that hosts the original documents establishing the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts or the Massachusetts Bay Colony. They also do public presentations, including rotary clubs and historical um, meetings and associations like the Medford Historical Society, which we are glad to have partnered with and pleased to have partnered with, partnership, partnered with for this presentation. There also does ex exhibits and plays all the time. A uh, year ago, I mean earlier this year, they did a play called I Want to Go to Jail, which commemorated the uh, 19th Amendment's approval on the uh, August 18th of 2020. Previous exhibits have included one on Civil War, one on Rev Road to Revolution, uh, Sacco and Vanzetti, American, African American participations to the government, and many others that tell the story of Massachusetts Bay. They also introduce students to the history through the student involvement and through uh, 
co-ops and work study students. And Stephen is being ably assisted tonight by uh, Lior Zappel, who is a student from Northeastern University who is there helping students and helping faculty to understand and use the museum. This presentation, The Tale of Two Colonies, commemorates the 400th anniversary of the founding of Plymouth by the arrival of the Mayflower and the 390th of the uh, founding of Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, people think about the Puritans. They say uh, the pilgrims were, uh, were nice, they were warm and, and nostalgic, and we have a nostalgic, is that, but that is accurate. And the Puritans, on the other hand, were seen harsh and intolerant, but is that accurate? And if, even if it is, it resulted in them founding a number of foundations which are central to our livelihood and our government today, a self-correcting over time. So this lecture explores similarities and some differences in the colonies and their longtime legacy of reform and how that affects you. This, this meeting, this presentation, The Tale of Two Colonies, will probably be followed by a full-scale exhibit sometime in the fall or the beginning of next year, but Stephen can tell us about that. So take it away, Stephen, and thank you very much. Thank you, and thanks again to the Medford Historical Society for the invitation. I thought I would be appearing in person, but I, I think we have to adjust because of what's happening in our country right now around the world. I also want to say hello to all of my friends at the partnership as you heard, I'm a trustee. I have been involved since 2004, and it's an area of great interest that I have. Usually when I begin a presentation, I invite people to come to the museum. And I'm gonna tell you what our status is right now. We are not open fully. Um, you see the slide there, a couple of scenes. The scene on the left is the treasures gallery that you just heard about. That is open on a limited basis. Uh, if you come two or three people, you can go in and see it. Uh, if people come who are not related, we request that they wait because it's kind of a small area. We also have a series of interactive galleries. There's one of them on the right. And those are not currently open. So I hope maybe in a few months, people will be able to come back and see everything we have. But if you really want to see the Treasures Gallery, that is a possibility. And just to draw your attention again to the, those two pictures, they are related to what I'm speaking about tonight. <clears throat> when we have our school groups, we explain that we had two colonies. Pilgrims came in 1620. Everybody in the fifth grade knows that. And then we tell them another group arrived in 1630 who were called the Puritans. And sometimes that gets a quizzical look. And we explain they had a document from the King of England called the Charter allowing them to set up the Massachusetts Bay Company. And that's the document you see there on the right. It's the first leaf of the charter of the governor and company of Massachusetts Bay in New England. It was brought here by John Winthrop in 1630 on the Arbella, and it was issued in 1629. And under that charter, they founded Boston, uh, Watertown, Newtown, which we now call Cambridge, and as you just heard, Medford. Um, so during the 17th century, we had the two colonies most of the time, but in 17, 1691, King William and Queen Mary issued another charter, which is on the left, creating the province of Massachusetts Bay. And that sort of is a bookend that ends this period. That combined the Plymouth and Mass Bay colonies. And everybody I'm sure is familiar with that famous uh, Copley portrait of Samuel Adams at the MFA. He is pointing at that charter. He is saying that the British are not following the rules for governing the colony. So that was in place up until the time of the revolution. Uh, just a quick overview of what else is there if you do come. We have the copper engraving plate that Paul Revere used to make the Boston Massacre image. Uh, you notice there maybe that we're in Secretary Galvin's office, the Commonwealth Museum. On July 4th, he was interviewed by CBS television nationally about one of the documents. Um, each of the colonies, each of the states, was sent an official copy of the Declaration of Independence by the Continental Congress. And we have that on display. It is signed by John Hancock, but it was uh, printed, and it was printed by a woman whose name was Mary Catherine Goddard. 
And they focused on that story about a woman, a woman getting the contract to do that. Next to that, we have one of the 14 originals of the Bill of Rights. It was sent by President Washington in 1789 with a cover letter requesting ratification. And a few years ago, we had a visit from the former Prime Minister of Italy. He's an attorney and he almost stepped back to see that, one of the 14 originals of this world famous document. So it gave us a perspective also on what we have there. Finally, we have our Massachusetts Constitution, 1780. It's written largely by John Adams. It's been amended, but not replaced. And it was a very important model for the federal constitution. This was done first and they're very similar. So because these documents protect our rights, we have a series of interactive galleries tracing the development of rights in Massachusetts. And the second picture there on the right is the 17th century gallery. <clears throat> And some people wonder, you know, what do you have in there if you're tracing rights? They assume that people were simply hanging witches and boring through the tongue with a red hot iron for blasphemy. Uh, sometimes I, I wonder if that law is still on the book someplace. You see a few people who maybe had that experience. But uh, in any event, um, to be serious, there is really more to that period than simply hanging witches. Um, they had some ideas that are surprisingly progressive, as we'll see. And it's important to keep in mind that they were very moralistic. So in the 17th century, that could mean uh, hanging witches. But many of their descendants continue to think about what's right and wrong. And often uh, reformers are descendants of the Puritans in this period. So Massachusetts was an important center for the abolitionist movement and other reform movements. And I think it can be traced in part back to the influence of 17th century Massachusetts. So I'd like to go ahead and talk first about the Plymouth Colony, then Mass Bay. Then I'm going to uh, compare uh, this region with some other regions in colonial America and finish up with sort of a great, greatest hits album, uh, some interesting things from the archives. So the next slide is about the world in 1620. And on the left, there is a famous map done by John Smith. And that's 1614. That is the map that gave the name New England to the region. And Plymouth appears on that map six years before the arrival of the Pilgrims. The reason it's up there is to show what was happening or call attention to what was happening along that coastline. Um, by the 1500s, European fishermen and explorers were bringing diseases with them and the local native population had no immunity. And we can certainly understand that today in the time of COVID, but in the 17th century, it was not understood. And many people in England interpreted that as a sign of God's favor, that he is really clearing the land for them. John Smith himself saw it that way. Uh, he came back later and he said that when, where there were once 100 to 200 people in a village, now there are only 10. Uh, when the pilgrims came, they didn't realize how bad it was, but by the time the Puritans came, they did. And before leaving, John Winthrop said, or wrote, that God has sent a miraculous plague whereby he has cleared the area of its inhabitants. And so that was the thought. This is being cleared maybe as a refuge for religious dissidents. Second picture in the middle you may not recognize, but you perhaps remember from your Western Civ courses, the Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648. And that was on the continent of Europe. Um, it was a war between Catholics and Protestants. And it started in Prague when some people were thrown out a window. It's called the defenestration of Prague. And this scene shows the retaliation for that. There were torture and executions. And then Europe, as I said, broke out in a prolonged war. It was an extremely brutal war. There were many atrocities on both sides. When you think about what was done to native people here, there are really parallels to the same techniques that were used in that war. We don't have an exact count of casualties, but estimates run into the millions. And they're not using the kind of weapons we have today. So it gives you a sense of how brutal it was. 
maybe 20% of the German speaking population of Europe was eliminated. And later it evolved into great, a great power conflict. France began aligning with Protestant countries, France of course was Catholic, to maintain a balance of power and it evolved into something different. But in 1620, 1630, people in England were looking at that and thinking that that could occur to, in their country as well. Finally, over there, we have King Charles I. And to backtrack a little bit, as you know, Henry VIII withdrew from the Catholic Church, started the Church of England. Many people felt that the reform did not go far enough. It was too much like the Catholic Church. So various dissidents began to demand changes. James I, the father of this king, uh, demanded conformity. He said that he would harry the dissidents out of the kingdom or worse. And when he was on the throne, the pilgrims did leave and came to Massachusetts. Uh, he was succeeded by his son. Eventually his um, policies led to civil war. He was executed and there was a period of Puritan rule. But in the 1620s, that was still in the future. And people like John Winthrop, looking at what was developing, wrote that maybe if it's God's will, he will find a shelter and a hiding place for us. And he too then began focusing on Massachusetts. So next slide uh, gives a little bit of uh, background coming to terms. I know we had an earlier lecture in the series, some of you may have heard it, about the difference between the Pilgrims and Puritans. Um, the top line there is from William Bradford of Plymouth Plantation. He was the governor, as you know. And he said, but they knew they were pilgrims. And what he's saying there is that they knew they were pilgrims in a religious sense. They didn't call themselves pilgrims in the 17th century. That came later. Bradford's account was at the Old South Church. During the revolution, some British soldiers apparently took it back with them to England and it was in the library of the Bishop of London. And then in the middle of, 19th, middle of 19th century, it was returned to Massachusetts. So people read these things and said, oh, they're the pilgrims. And so uh, by the middle of the 19th century, it became more common to refer to them as pilgrims. I did read that a, uh, a minister gave a lecture in the late, uh, later 18th century where he used the term, but it became more common later. So what is the difference between pilgrims and Puritans? Uh, the pilgrims were separatists. They wanted to totally separate from the Church of England. And the Puritans wanted to purify it from within. But in practice, they probably had more in common than, than, more than their differences. They were both Calvinist followers of John Calvin. One of the things that Calvin stressed was the importance of reading the Bible in your own vernacular language and weeding out things that were added by the Catholic Church uh, just to uh, you know, get back to the basics, you might say. And one example is Christmas. It didn't give the date of December 25th for Christmas. So both of these colonies banned the celebration of Christmas. Uh, another distinctive thing among the Calvinists was the belief in predestination. The idea that before you're born, God has decided whether you're going to heaven or hell. It's kind of difficult to understand the appeal of that. Although if you think there's gonna be widespread damnation, maybe you at least have a hope of salvation and a great deal of anxiety. And there's a lot of discussion about this and some conflict about it. Maybe could there be some loopholes? You know, Maybe if you're leading a good life, it means you have God's favor. Maybe if you're prosperous, it means you have God's favor. That was debated at times. Uh, there's an interesting book, a fun book uh, by Sarah Vowell. She's a woman of Native American ancestry and it's called The Wordy Shipmates. And uh, it's uh, quite humorous. I think I don't agree with her on everything, but maybe she doesn't agree with me on everything. Um, and when you first start into it, it may seem a bit silly, but if you stay with it, she does have some insights. And at one point she imagines a missionary trying to convert native people and saying, I'm here to bring you the good news that you may be predestined to go to hell and you cannot do anything about it. So, so much, I guess, for predestination. 
Uh, but these are some of the ideas that were shared by both of the, in both of the colonies. And as I said, they probably were more similar than different. And it's not probably wrong to see the pilgrims as part of the Puritan movement. So we'll go to the next slide. And here we have some familiar images of Plymouth. And we might say that the pilgrims had better uh, public relations than the Puritans. Their story is certainly accessible to school groups. So we have the boys of the Mayflower, uh, the very harsh winter, first winter in the new world, uh, friendly natives coming forward to teach the pilgrims how to plant and how to fish. And then finally, we had this celebration with the native people, which is often associated with the idea of the first Thanksgiving. So um, I think the children's poet, Longfellow, also embellished the story uh, with the courtship of Miles Standish. So take a little more careful look at that now. What actually happened, the Mayflower arrived they were off course. They had permission to land in the Virginia Territory, maybe around the Hudson River. Uh, it was getting late, the weather was deteriorating, so they landed at Cape Cod. There's a picture there of them signing the Mayflower Compact, and they actually did not have permission to be there, and Governor Bradford later wrote that they were both saints and strangers on board, uh, people who were religious, and there was some economic uh, probably immigrants who were added to make sure that the colony would work. Although most of them also apparently had tendencies toward Calvinist beliefs. But Bradford worried that some of them might leave. So they came up with this uh, document called the Mayflower Compact. They agreed to set up a government and agreed to abide by the laws. So sometimes people come to us and wonder if we are, if we have the Mayflower Compact, it wasn't saved as a document, but it does uh, appear in Bradford's writings, which are at the State House. So we have a scan of the text in our museum. Um, things didn't go totally smoothly. You may know that when they landed, they were worried about not having enough food. They found a, a stash of corn, which they stole, and alienated some of the Indians on Cape Cod by doing that. Later, they paid it back. They did have a very tough winter. They were approached by two native people who spoke English, uh, Samoset and Tisquantum. They had been kidnapped and brought to England and they were sent to meet the pilgrims by the man on the right. That is Massasoit. I understand that is actually a title. It's a D Massasoit. His name was Osama Quinn, but he was in a difficult situation. His people had been really very severely depleted by the plague. And the place where the pilgrims landed, uh, Pawkin, was, was formerly a settlement and uh, nobody was left living there. Um, Squanto or Tisquantum was the only survivor from that. Uh, so Massasoit was concerned about other native enemies like the Narragansett. They were not so much depleted one reason may have been they were hostile toward the Wampanoags who were uh, the people of Massasoit. And maybe because they didn't have too much contact with them, maybe they didn't get the plague as much. But Massasoit was worrying about maybe being overrun. And the pilgrims were also concerned, they have a very small group. So they formed an alliance and a treaty of friendship. And that really worked for quite a long time, for many decades. Those two groups sort of stayed together. And one example of it, it was really quite close at times. Edward Winslow was the primary diplomat for the colony. And he seems to have been sort of an anthropologist. At least he had an interest in other cultures, which not all the people did. And he, uh, at one point, heard that Massasoit was close to death. And he went and visited, and he used his own fingers, and Winslow did, to clear Massasoit's throat. And he gave him chicken soup, and that helped Massasoit to recover. Uh, gave him later the recipe for chicken soup. So they formed this alliance, which continued for some time. But things didn't go smoothly with all of the Native people. Just mention one incident in 1623, 
there were rumors that the colony might be attacked by Indians farther up the coast, maybe the Massachusetts. And Miles Standish was sent up to Wessagusset, now Weymouth. Um, and he invited some of them to come to a dinner in a barn. And then they made a signal, they closed the doors. He stabbed two of them to death. Another was uh, later killed. Several more were hunted down and killed. And that was to prevent apparently what he thought would be a preemptive attack on Plymouth. But it certainly, uh, you know, changed the image a bit of the pilgrims among people who were not aligned with Massasoit. Uh, when you read about that, it almost sounds like a gang war. Uh, Standish had encountered one of the Indians before that, seemed to feel he was being disrespected, and he had it in for him because of that. So, you know, Plymouth, it's a quaint story, and in some ways, it is somewhat accurate. Um, Plymouth was probably small, it was smaller than Massachusetts Bay. Um, it was a little poorer, so they did not have the capability really to clamp down over a wide area. And despite what I told you about Standish, I think the leaders tended to be relatively moderate for the time. You know, they would not be in tune with us today, but for the time, relatively moderate. I want to talk about two of them next. So uh, on the left, we have an actor who was portraying Elder Brewster in Plymouth. And in the middle, there's a statue of Governor Bradford. And it is sort of a colonial revival mode. Um, they imagined that they all wore broad brimmed hats. They dressed in black and they had a lot of belt buckles. They must have established the belt buckle factory as the first priority. Uh, we now know that they actually didn't look like, didn't dress like that. Always. They dressed in uh, what were called sad colors. Those were um, autumn hues usually. Sometimes they were dressed in bright colors. Sometimes the minister or a governor would dress in black. It's more formal, but it's not the stereotype that we have. And on the right, we have an image of Governor Bradford's home in England. I've seen pictures of it not whitewashed, and that entrance I think was added later. But it just shows that what social class perhaps he came from. He's not wealthy, but he was not extremely poor as some people were. He had a, a roof over his head and a somewhat substantial house. So I want to talk first about Elder Brewster. Uh, he also was not poor. His father was the postmaster in Scrooby, England. And that may not sound too exalted, but he also worked for the bishop and apparently had a decent income. They lived in a manor house, an English Tudor manor house. Uh, Brewster went to Cambridge University. He made many contacts with the, local, with the establishment at that time. And he's very bright. He liked to read. He had a, a library of 450 books. A lot of them dealt with religion. He became a diplomat. He was an aide to the Secretary of State who was named William Davison. And he actually was given a, a medal or an award directly from Queen Elizabeth I. But his boss, Davison, was scapegoated for the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots. It's a whole other story. But he felt that his boss had been treated unfairly. And I'm sure this happens in Washington, D.C. Someone is out of favor, and everybody says, I've never heard of him before. Uh, Brewster didn't feel comfortable with that maybe had the idea that he's climbing the wrong ladder. And instead of pursuing that type of career, he turned more to religion, had meetings in his home, eventually went to Holland. He had a printing press over there and uh, there was a warrant for his arrest. Uh, we often are cynical and think they all came to make money. That was not the case with Brewster. He uh, lost money. He gave most of what he had away to settle, to establish the colony. And um, he traded relatively privileged life for a simple cottage in Plymouth. And Bradford said of him that he was tender-hearted and compassionate of such as were in misery. So I think he seems to have been a, a decent person, uh, probably a person of high character. He was the religious leader. They did not have a minister at first, but he was called Elder Brewster for that reason. Uh, Bradford was sort of a protege. As a young man, his parents had died, 
and he um, turned to, he was also seriously ill, and he spent a lot of time reading books about religion. And he came under the influence of Brewster, decided to follow him to Holland, and he did have other family members, and they thought it was kind of dumb, you know, to do that. He's got this house, he owns some land, they might be able to get even richer, and uh, you know, why do what John Lewis did? You remember the uh, civil rights activist? He got into good trouble. I think that's what, what uh, Bradford did as well, even though he wouldn't express it that way. So he went to Holland and then eventually became the governor in Plymouth. He was basically a moderate person, I would say, but he could be tough to uh, when the colony was threatened. And he was not an empire builder. The religious mission was primary for him. And he was a little even nervous as the colony began to grow. Uh, he had to support the colony. They had a trading post in Maine, for example. But he worried even when they went as far as Duxbury <clears throat> that maybe um, you know they might be getting away from their religious mission. When the Mass Bay colony started, he um, had mixed feelings. It helped Plymouth economically. They could sell things to the new settlers, but he was worried that they would get away from the religious mission. And unlike Brute, unlike uh, Winslow. Uh, he was not extremely hostile to Native people, but he was suspicious. Uh, he wrote an account of torture that he had heard about or seen, and certainly torture was also used in England, but it made him wonder if maybe they were influenced by the devil. So he held back a bit compared to others, but again, he was not really trying to massacre Native people either. So I want to go ahead and talk about what happened over time with the next slide. We had a long period, maybe over 50 years, where the Alliance held. But if you look at the court records in Plymouth, you can see that gradually the attitude toward Native people became harsher over time. And I want to give a little bit of um, feeling for that by talking about a few cases. Case in 1638, uh, four English indentured servants ran away. They went to the home of Roger Williams. He didn't know who they were. He extended some hospitality to them. And then they continued along the way. They encountered a Nipmuc Indian and they robbed him and stabbed him. And the Indian was brought to the home of Roger Williams. He knew him. Uh, before dying, he told him what had happened. And Roger Williams basically solved the case, figured out what had happened, and put out the word to search. Escaped. One of them was named Arthur Peach, and I think it's uh, because of the name Peach, his name stands out from the others. But they were tried in the Plymouth Colony, and they were hanged. And Governor Bradford felt that it was important to make that statement that they did respect Native lives. So that's relatively early. Now, another example of that is a case involving adultery between a native man and an English woman in Duxbury, which is now Duxbury. And she was treated more harshly. And possibly they would treat a woman more harshly in that case anyway. But because he was an Indian, they were a little more lenient with the man. And so she was sentenced to be brought through on a cart and whipped through the town. And then she would have to wear a letter A on her blouse or on her clothing. And if she was seen out in public, um, she would be branded on the face with a red hot iron. So when I say Plymouth is moderate, it's sort of relatively moderate, not by today's standard. He was sentenced to be whipped, which is not great, but they did not want to go perhaps too far to alienate native people. Another case I found very interesting involved a slave. I'm assuming he was an enslaved man. He was a black man who fathered a child with a white woman. And there would be some places around the world where that would be a really dangerous thing for him. In the Plymouth Colony, he was uh, basically assigned to, to uh, pay child support. That if the child lived for up to a year, he would pay support. If he could not afford to pay it, his master would pay it, so I assume he was a slave. And then if the master could not afford it, he would be assigned to work for the deputy governor 
and uh, basically his wages would be garnished. So uh, it's a little bit surprising, perhaps, that a sign of somewhat moderate approach. But over time, as the population grew in Plymouth, and especially as the English population grew with the Massachusetts Bay Colony, attitudes became a lot harsher toward the native people. And we ended up having, uh, instead of leniency, more whippings, um, eventually selling more of them into slavery. So uh, later there was a case of a man named Hokin, 1679. Uh, he was whipped and then sold into slavery. So you went from you know, relatively early, these good relations with native people to a deterioration over time. Let's call your attention to those two um, images there. That is Edward Winslow that I mentioned earlier who saved Massasoit. Um, by 1675, he was dead. His son, Josiah Winslow, was the governor of the Plymouth Colony. And on the right, we have King Philip, also known as Medicom or Medicomet or Permedicom. And he was uh, the son of Massasoit. And in 1675, he was the sachem of the Wampanoag. And um, when the, a war broke out in 1675, King Philip's War, you have the irony of Josiah Winslow being the commander in chief of the colonial forces. And he did not personally kill King Philip, but they hunted him down and he was killed. And his head was put on a pike and it was displayed at Plymouth for 20 years, which is very shocking to us today. I would say though, um, when you think of the 30 years war, that type of thing was also common in Europe. It doesn't mean it's all right, but um, it was a very brutal age. King Philip's son then was sold into slavery. So, uh, you know, it was a sort of an unhappy ending, uh, a downward spiral in relations with the Plymouth colony. But I would say overall, despite that, it had a reputation for relative moderation. And I'll give a few examples of that. In the Mass Bay colony, there were, uh, I think, 86 witch trials. That includes um, the Salem witch trials, which were actually after the colony had uh, lost its charter. And I think 36 executions. In Plymouth, there were two witch trials. Both of them led to acquittals, and the people who made the accusation were whipped for making false accusations. Um, another example in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, four Quakers were hanged on uh, Boston Common. Came across uh, a case where someone had a Quaker meeting in his home and he was fined for that. And some people who got into trouble in Mass Bay fled to Plymouth. Uh, the first president of Harvard uh, became, had some religious, different religious ideas and uh, he had to step down. And he went to Plymouth and he lived in Situate so that uh, he was a little bit safer there. One of the members of the assistance, Council of Assistance in the Mass Bay Colony also had some ideas of maybe greater religious freedom. So he moved to Situate also. So one historian said um, he dipped a toe into the Plymouth Colony. So it was relatively moderate compared to the later Mass Bay Colony. I want to turn next to something everybody we find interesting, I think, and what is the true story of Thanksgiving? That is actually a uh, picture of a Thanksgiving dinner using foods that were available at that time. So the main thing at that feast in 1621, the main course was probably venison, but they probably also did have uh, turkey because turkey was uh, native to the area and other game birds. If you look there, they had pumpkin dishes. That was a uh, local crop. They didn't have cranberry sauce, but they did have cranberries. Um, so they were probably cranberry dishes. Did they have mashed potatoes, do you think? Uh, no, potatoes came from Peru. They were brought to Spain by the Spanish, eventually went to England, and then were brought to Massachusetts by the English in the 17th century. And I found a document, uh, a banquet, an admiralty banquet during that period. And one of the things on the menu were potatoes, P-E-R-T-A-T-O-E-S. Another question, did they have apple pie? 
you have the expression as American as apple pie? The answer to that is no. Uh, apples were not native to North America. Only crab apples were here. Apples are actually native to Kazakhstan, Central Asia. And Alma-Ata means father of the apple. And that was along the Silk Road to China. And it's believed people, it's known people uh, ate the apples, took some with them, tossed them aside. And eventually apples spread all the way to China in one direction and to the Roman Empire in the other direction. Romans brought them to England and they were brought here by English settlers. They also brought, um, brought bees to pollinate the apple crop. And the English, the native people called bees English flies. So that's a little bit about the menu items at that time, but a little about the development of the holiday. In 1623, there actually was a feast that was called the Thanksgiving in Plymouth. 1636, there was a description of the Thanksgiving in Situate, and they sent, spent the day in the meeting house, but then after that, then making merry to the creatures, the poorer sort being invited of the richer, meaning wealthier people gave a meal to people who were poorer. Um, as I told you before, they had banned the celebration of Christmas. And so the theory is maybe that is why Thanksgiving developed. They may have wanted to have a holiday. And why would it be on Thursday? Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne had written about the great and Thursday lecture. Thursday was lecture day for Puritan ministers. So, <coughs> excuse me, possibly that is why Thursday ended up being the day of Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving um, was a northern, northern holiday developed in Massachusetts and in other uh, states that were influenced by the Puritans. It was not a southern holiday in the 19th century. And as you know, probably Abraham Lincoln declared it a national holiday. And after the Civil War, national circulation publications popularized it around the country. But by the middle of the 19th century in Massachusetts, you would have recognized it. It would have had maybe a religious service in the morning, but then a turkey dinner with some of the ingredients that we associate with um, Thanksgiving. It's also interesting that in the early 19th century, they did not associate it with the pilgrims. Um, they only did that after rereading Bradford and Winslow's account in the middle of the 19th century. In fact, the tradition of having football games on Thanksgiving is older than the idea that the, that the pilgrims were involved. But uh, during the colonial revival period, it fit in well. And uh, since then, we have associated the pilgrims with Thanksgiving. I don't think that's totally wrong. They didn't know they were starting a holiday. But uh, these customs did begin in Massachusetts and in New England. And as we know now, Thanksgiving, um, to native people, some native people is not a celebration. It's a day of mourning and it marks the beginning of uh, a long period of decline, maybe in disillusionment. And so, you know, we respect that. This year, we're not celebrating Plymouth, we're commemorating Plymouth. And who knows what the future will bring. Uh, some people would say that this actually, that first meal was kind of a model of good relationships between people from very different backgrounds. We'll have to see over time how the thinking develops on that. So I wanna turn next to the Massachusetts Bay Colony and we have the Great Migration. 1630, 11 ships came and then several more came. So there were about 17 in total. So right away, this was a much bigger uh, group than in Plymouth. And that is the charter that I mentioned a few minutes ago that's in the treasures gallery. And this was a joint stock company, you know, a private company would run a colony. And if it was, if it was unsuccessful, the king wouldn't lose money. If it was successful, uh, he would be able to cash in in many ways on the colony. So we look at the structure of that. There's a governor who has been compared to the president of the company. There was a group of assistants who had been compared to like a board of directors. I think their role was a little more complex than that, but you know, roughly you could say that. And then there was a mention of a general court. That was like a stockholders meeting. 
and all of the men in the colony who were members of the church would belong to the general court and would make the laws. As the colony grew, that became unwieldy, so they decided to have them select representatives to the general court. So we had a legislature. And um, that is why the Massachusetts legislature is called the general court today. It's not a court, but um, it goes back to that terminology. Another thing I could have labeled this um, differently, I thought of possibly calling it City on a Hill. And everybody's heard of that lay sermon by John Winthrop on the Arbella, uh, City on a Hill. And sometimes now it is presented as an arrogant statement of American exceptionalism. And people draw a straight line from there to intervening in Vietnam or in um, Iraq. And I would say uh, you probably should read it. I don't really see it that way. Um, one thing that John Winthrop said, there will always be rich and poor, so they're not communists. But he also said sort of a com communitarian uh, idea, maybe not socialism, but it almost sounds a little like that, saying that you would have to give of your superfluities, not a word that I use that often, to support others' necessities. If you have a surplus, you should help people less fortunate. And he said that they should delight in each other, the colonists rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together. So it's kind of a, a communitarian vision. And he also said, if we are successful, we will be like a city on a hill. It will be an example to other colonies and maybe to the Church of England. <coughs> excuse me, but, excuse me, uh, allergy season. But he also said that, um, you know, if we fail, we won't look good. I was thinking it's almost like a wide receiver in football. If you catch the ball, you look good. If you drop the ball, everybody's watching and you look bad. So it wasn't really an arrogant statement from my point of view. A few years ago, I had a call late in the afternoon from the Kennedy Library, and Caroline Kennedy was visiting, and she wanted to take a tour of our museum. So I gave her a tour. Uh, she was very knowledgeable about this period because as many of you know, her father gave a speech as the president-elect to the Massachusetts legislature where he used the term city on a hill. And um, it was interesting, shortly after that, she was appointed ambassador to Japan and she really was quite gracious. I think she would be good in that role. It's quite, a, it's an interesting experience to meet someone like that. As I was talking to her, I'm imagining all those photographs of her as a child in the Oval Office, and you're actually talking to that person. It's kind of a fun aspect of this job. She went back to the Kennedy Library and uh, encouraged all the staff to visit. So they came over in shifts, and it's very helpful to, to us to get people visiting the museum. Um, the image was also used by Ronald Reagan when he gave a City on the Hill speech, called it a shining city on the hill. And uh, sometimes people refer to Ronald Reagan's City on a Hill speech, but I want you to know it goes back farther than that. It goes back to John Winthrop. You can go to our next slide. And I think it's interesting to look at the sociology of this movement. And they were, the Puritans were rebelling against the king and the aristocracy. They thought they were corrupt and hypocritical. King of England is the head of the Church of England, but he also has mistresses, and many people knew that. It was also common for wealthy aristocrats to have that lifestyle as well. So uh, they were not free of hypocrisy, the Puritans, but they did not just have a cynical attitude about things like that. So I just wanted to show an example of how a wealthy aristocrat could live. That's Hatfield House. That is the home of the Cecil family, and they were advisors to the kings during this period. Um, you might be given a great grant of land for military service or for other service to the king. And you would get all the rents from that area. A great grant of land is a grant of great wealth. Even the richest people today don't often live like this. And so I wanted to show you that. Um, and if you had that uh, grant, you also would belong to the House of Lords you would have a title and you would have hereditary power. One of the members of the family became prime minister in the 19th century and uh, his name was Lord Salisbury. I enjoy reading about him. He seemed to have a sense of humor, a dry sense of humor. Apparently he had a lab in the house 
And one day there was a major explosion, a big explosion. He came out looking like a cartoon character who was smoking. And he had a dry sense of humor. He just said to his wife, I think I'm going to have to replace, repeat the sodium experiment. But in any event, this is an example of great wealth. And the next slide, I want to talk about the social class system at that time in England. So we have aristocracy at the top. The next group uh, lumped three groups together. We have the gentry. They uh, just back one, just the gentry. Um, they are also landowners. They are comfortable, not quite at the level though of the great aristocrats. And they, some of them were merchants, people in this class. They might have been merchants who went to sea, or they might have been um, sheep mer merchants in the wool trade. I've also used the term professionals. I'm thinking about a lawyer. As capitalism developed, you needed to have somebody who would uh, maybe look at contracts and so forth. So this is a group of people who have skills, maybe in some cases more modern skills than the aristocracy, and they feel they're being held back. They feel that God does not give out talents on a hereditary basis. So the leaders of the group came from these classes. And John Winthrop was all three, that's his picture. He was a member of the gentry. He had this estate called Groton. Um, he also was in the wool trade and he was an attorney. And he went up to London and he was involved in a court uh, which gave guardians to wards. If a wealthy person died, kind of elderly, and the, it was a young child who didn't have a guardian, some would be assigned to do that. And in fact, um, it was often a matter of corruption. People would pay bribes in order to be able to be given a guardianship. And Winthrop was uncomfortable with that. He had some scruples. He began to think maybe, uh, like others, that maybe he's climbing the wrong ladder. Didn't want to be a corrupt lawyer. There was a downturn in the wool trade. He had a lot of financial setbacks and maybe decided that God is telling him it's time to, to move and to do something different. But I wanted to show you that, that's the state, that building at one time was a home. It was also used to administer the estate, probably been remodeled a bit since then. However, um, you know, it shows that uh, he's not poor, not at the level of the great aristocrats, but you know, he's comfortable. And when he arrived, he came with uh, eight servants. Quickly, the next group who were Puritans are more like a middle class, a yeoman farmer, someone, a small family farm. Shopkeepers, um, they had cash. And even then, it was easier for wealthy people to avoid taxes. And the shopkeepers were kind of sitting ducks for a tax collector. They didn't like that. They didn't like to give money. Uh, they would go to building elaborate churches. So some of them were Puritans, uh, you know, craftsmen, blacksmiths, things like that. So they often were members of this, uh, thought this way. Next, we have laborers and servants. And the Puritans believed that work was dignified. So there were some people who were not rich, but did work for others. And that was respected. And in old age, they would be uh, supported because of that. Finally, I'm using the term the poorer sort. There were people who Puritans felt really did not have a very good work ethic and maybe they were drifting around. Maybe they didn't have God's favor. You know, we think of predestination and you don't want too many people like that around in the colony. Um, in New England, sometimes poor people would be warned out, uh, you know, told not to come here. And so when they came, they carefully eliminated the top and bottom classes. We pay, watch my next slide, it's that right there, I'm sorry. And they carefully replicated these middle classes. So people at the top were like Winthrop, there was a middle class, there was a working class. And they did maintain class distinctions. You know, you could not wear a lace or a dress in a sumptuous way if you were not in that class. If you dressed your children or servants above your social status, you would um, be fined. And the tailor who made the clothes would have to double, get a double forfeiture of the value of the clothes. So there's still a class consciousness here. I just want to conclude this particular thing by going back, I'm sorry, um, talking about what happened in England. There was a civil war, as you know, 
between the aristocracy and the Puritans. And I didn't see the documentary, but uh, there was a documentary in England uh, about, called Roundhead or Cavalier. And the Cavaliers were the aristocrats and the Roundheads were the Puritans. And I read a review of it in The Guardian and it said that it shows the fierce duality of the British national character. One side being flamboyant, poodle permed, lazy, fun loving, and scornful of rules. Those are the Cavaliers. The other side being tidy, disciplined, uh, power mad, and good at punctuation. And those are the roundheads. And the Massachusetts was founded by people who were good at punctuation. That was the group that came in. They were fairly rigorous and uh, they were not getting by on room presence. They really looked into things and they're formidable in that sense. So I want to go to the next slide. And I'm going to just talk uh, topically about a few things. Um, the Puritans had democratical practices. They rejected democracy in theory, but uh, John Cotton, prominent minister, said they had to admit their practices were democratical. And I've chosen the Old Ship Meeting House in Hingham to illustrate that. And then I explained to the school kids when they come that they built a meeting house and they would be um, on Sunday church services, but then a town meeting later in the week or later in the month to do government business in the town. And it's interesting, um, this connection between the church and democracy. Minister, <coughs> excuse me, I need a, <laughs> another one of these, sorry. A little dry in here tonight. I'm going to take another. Uh, you picked your own minister, and so the congregation selected its own minister. So, if you're willing to do that, something that's as important as that, you could also select your public officials and you could participate in discussions. So, town meetings, even people who are not members of the church, could participate and uh, you could bring things up. And it was really almost like a form of direct democracy. And when the Puritans arrived, they actually went down to Plymouth, saw the way the church was organized, and they copied that. So again, ministers are not public officials, but the congregational model in selecting a minister probably contributed to democratic practices generally. When it came to the, comes to the uh, colony, at large, there were elections and any man who was a member of the church could vote and there was no property qualification. And there were very strict limits on terms. They did not want a hereditary aristocracy. So there were often annual elections. So elections were part of the process and it was all right to criticize leaders. Both colonies also had something that resembled a Bill of Rights. Um, in both in Plymouth, 1636, that came up with something like that. In the Mass Bay Colony, it was the Body of Liberties in 1641. And if you read it, it's amazing how things like court trials are very similar to what um, we have today. And there are quite a few rights accorded to people who are accused. A lot of rights generally, um, if you're not from the colony and you're visiting and you're accused of something, you get the same rights as a person who is from the colony. I'm guessing that wouldn't apply maybe to Catholic priests visiting the colony, but uh, to other people it would apply. Uh, a couple of interesting things in the body of liberties that uh, women and men were not equal, but men were supposed to treat their wives with respect. And it was illegal for a husband to beat his wife. Uh, something that's not very modern, the body of liberties included um, the sanction of slavery. And they read about it in the Bible. And they followed the Bible carefully. And the Israelites were told that they could not enslave other Israelites, but you could take people who were just uh, captives in a war, in a just war, or people who were sold to you or who offered themselves to you. And so um, they didn't really think slavery was wrong. We'll talk a little about more about that later. I would say though that it's not a 21st century democracy. There were laws against blasphemy, blasphemy. There were some pretty harsh punishments. 
for people in Medford, you may know that um, the Isaac Royal House was John Winthrop's farm, Ten Hills Farm. He had a servant who mismanaged uh, the finances and the man was banished from the colony and sentenced to have both of his ears cut off. So again, it's kind of a rough period, not funny. It's not a modern democracy, but probably planting the seeds of democracy. Next slide is about something that's unique to Massachusetts. Among all the 17th century groups, the Puritans valued education the most. Uh, remember, they thought everybody should be able to read the Bible. So they had a law which we refer to as the old deluder Satan law uh, in order to frustrate schemes from that old deluder Satan to keep people from knowledge of the scriptures, we're gonna have public schools. So every town with 50 families had to have a public school. If you had a hundred families, you had to have a Latin school that would prepare people to go to college. And they also founded a college, obviously Harvard College, it's the oldest in America. They thought that was important for training ministers and leaders in the colony. As I said, this was kind of a unique thing. Uh, everybody around the world wasn't doing that. During this period, the governor of Virginia, Berkeley, said, I thank God there are no free schools or printing, and I hope we shall not have them for 100 years. For learning has brought disobedience and heresy and sent to the world, and printing has divulged them. God keep us free from both. So no public schools in Virginia. In Pennsylvania, there were some public schools, but among the early Quakers, there was a belief you should be able to read the Bible, but if you pursued higher education, that might undermine re religious faith. So they did not initially have colleges. This was kind of unique to Massachusetts. And about a year ago, reading something uh, by Reuters, they were estimating the three most uh, innovative universities in the world. And they ranked Stanford first, but then after that, Harvard and MIT. So you can imagine Harvard, two of the three most innovative universities in the world are in Massachusetts. And as you well know, Boston is a great center for education, including Northeastern University, which our students are helping produce this tonight. Um, <clears throat> And one point I'd make about it is those institutions are self-correcting over time. You know, if you teach people to read, uh, they will read a variety of things. And by the time of the American Revolution, um, America had a much higher literacy rate than England. Massachusetts had the highest literacy rate in America. So um, this is an important legacy from the Puritans, and it's a positive thing. Next slide is about science. Several scholars, including Max Weber, Robert K. Merton, have noted the connection of the interest that the Puritans had in science. Um, and this is not always the case with religious people. Some of them worry that if you study science, it will undermine your faith. They thought opposite, that God, you wanted to study uh, nature to find out what God's purposes were, and that the intellect had been darkened by the fall of Adam and Eve, and you should try to recover that. This is a picture of John Winthrop Jr. And he was in the Massachusetts government, then he went to Connecticut, eventually became the governor of that colony. And he had a very serious interest in science. Um, he was a Christian alchemist. Alchemists were not only trying to turn lead into gold, but they were also um, interested in science generally. I thought this was a little bit interesting. They communicated internationally with us. And you'll have to pardon my French, but it was referred to as the chiffre indechiffrable, meaning it's the unbreakable cipher. And for hundreds of years, it was not broken. And it kind of surprises me that in this little backwater area, somebody would be communicating with that cipher. Just as an aside, uh, the Japanese early in the 20th century didn't realize it had been broken. So they had one of their coding machines, the diplomatic machine, based on the big and ear. And American cryptanalysts recognized it and were able to start reading the Japanese diplomatic codes, not military codes, before Pearl Harbor. It's just a little side, side there, sidebar. I'm showing the map because it shows New England, nice looking map but uh, also shows the areas of John Winthrop's interest. 
Um, he thought there was some black ore around Southbridge, Massachusetts. Maybe that would mean silver. So he had the idea that he would mine the silver, bring it down the Thames River to New London, and New London would be a great center both for science and for commerce. Turned out that the ore was not silver, it was uh, graphite. But not to miss an opportunity, he wrote to one of his partners, maybe they could make combs out of graphite and sell them to women in Spain and Italy who wanted to color their hair. So always looking for a chance. A little more about his interest in science. He went to Turkey. He realized that uh, Protestants were not the only ones who knew about science. He studied science then in the Islamic world. He went to Belgium to study science, study um, metallurgy um, in a Catholic country. He came back, he set up a blast furnace in what is now Quincy. That was not very successful, but the technology ended up being used in the Saugus Ironworks. And as I said, he went down, founded New London. Uh, he was a doctor. He was often well liked. He had a warm manner, apparently. Not everybody liked him. I've heard a couple of bad things, but I won't pass them along. But uh, most people seem to like him. He tried to shelter Native people. And the point I'd make about him is his interest in science caused him to have some skepticism about witchcraft. He believed there were, witch there were witches, certainly. But um, he thought maybe there might be other explanations also. And there was a case where he uh, ended up um, counseling a woman that we're going to give you a second chance. If you stop doing what you're doing, you won't be executed. Uh, when he became governor, there were no further executions. There were witch trials, but no further executions in Connecticut. Next slide, just briefly talking about the interest that they had uh, in business. And there's a quote there from Edward Winslow. I thought that was kind of a <clears throat> fun image on the left there. It's a coffee house. Coffee was thought to be an appropriate drink for ambitious Puritans and, and for ambitious Protestants because it was a stimulant. And Lloyd's of London was a coffee house and um, insurance agents began meeting there and ended up um, becoming uh, an insurance company. We had coffee in Massachusetts by 1670. But the bigger point is that business was important to the Puritans, but they also believed that it should be regulated. They did not have an ideological opposition to the role of government. And you see on the right, the townhouse that was uh, built with money that was given by Robert Keene. He was the wealthiest merchant in Boston, and he was accused of unfair business practices. So he was fined and he was humiliated. And he gave money for that, perhaps to rehabilitate himself. But John Cotton, the minister, gave a lecture about it and said that you should not sell low, buy, high, buy low and sell high. You should not take advantage of people's ignorance and so forth. So they do not believe in unregulated capitalism. And when you look at their laws, there are a number of things that sort of reflect that. If you went to sea as a sailor, before going to sea, you would have to sign a contract so there would not be a dispute about wages afterwards. Uh, there were laws on the taking of deer. When they first arrived, they killed too many deer, but then there were laws to conserve deer. There were wage, there were price controls. So I guess the point is that I'm making that they thought business was important, but you can see the idea that sometimes business has to be regulated for the common good. So those are positive things. And I wanna to turn to quickly to Two things that are somewhat negative from that period. Um, so the next slide is about the connection with native people. And I've already talked a little bit about this. I want to talk about two very disturbing incidents. I'm not going to give you the whole history of relations, but in 1637, there was a war with the Pequot people in Connecticut. And one of our uh, lecturers a year ago from Yale University talked about economics and how people coming from England would actually bring cash, not cash, but coins with them. Uh, they also used Spanish coins, but they had a shortage of money and the Pequots had wampum. And one of the motivations for trying to uh, go down to Connecticut was to get control of that. So in 1637, 
uh, both colonies, but mainly Massachusetts Bay sent soldiers down. And in near Mystic, Connecticut, they surrounded the Pequot village. And they went in when the fighting got rough, they backed out of there, set the village on fire. And as people fled, they shot them down. And that is a, a, a current day image of what had happened. So a very shocking thing, a couple of people involved were John Underhill and John Mason. And John Underhill wrote to justify it. Should not Christians have more mercy and, and compassion? When a people has grown to such a height of blood and sin against God and man, sometimes the scripture declareth women and children must perish with the parents. We had sufficient light from the word of God for our proceedings. So that's a little chilling. Uh, you could imagine some fundamentalists doing that around the world today. John Mason was also involved in that. He said, God was above them, making them as a fiery oven. Thus did the Lord judge among the heathen. heathen. So um, we don't look at it this way today, obviously. There was another very similar incident in King Philip's war um, called the Great Swamp Fight. And this has led to really a long-term lack of trust between Native people and non-Native people continues to today and it's understanding, understandable. And if you work with them, I think it's always important to uh, defer to them to get their point of view on things. Another uh, controversial thing is the attitude towards slavery. This is the next slide. And that is, um, Zanzibar, not Massachusetts, but it's evocative. It's a monument to the slave trade. And in Massachusetts, I would say, as I said, slavery was legal because it was in the Bible. Um, what did they think of it? Uh, there was an interesting essay by Cotton Mather, and he said that he thought that um, Europeans are not a majority of the world's population and that God would not create all these people if they could not be saved. He thought that Africans were intelligent. He said some people say they're barbarian, but our ancestors were called barbarians also. And so he seems to be kind of uh, up to date in his thinking, but then he kind of turns around and he says, if you give them religious training, they will realize that God's will is for them to be slaves and they will accept it. So uh, the thing I find interesting about that it's not a racist statement exactly. He's not saying they're inferior, although uh, obviously he's not giving them equal rights. Another um, thing in the middle there is uh, the connection with the islands of the West Indies. Massachusetts were not a big center of the slave trade at this time going to Africa, but they did provide a lot of food for plantations in the West Indies, Barbados, Antigua, and uh, plantation owners maximized profits by uh, planting sugarcane, and then they imported food and other things from Massachusetts. That is a bill of lading for ship delivering things to Barbados. On the return trip, they did bring slaves to Massachusetts, and many prominent families held, held slaves. Um, I would say that the only thing that perhaps saved Massachusetts, a couple of things. Um, Remember, they did not want too many poor people. They thought they might be a source of disruption. Winthrop was advised to rely on slaves, and he decided not to do that. So there was slavery, but not as many slaves as in the South. And conclude this by pointing to Samuel Sewell there on the right. He wrote the first anti-slavery tract. Um, he would not have 21st century attitudes about slavery, but he did. Um, feel that the slave trade was immoral. He was the judge in the Salem witch trials, began thinking about what was right and wrong after that. And finally, a little quickly, um, famous for religious intolerance. On the right, we have Ann Hutchinson. Uh, she was preaching in her home, and that was objected to, particularly by John Winthrop. Uh, she was tried, and she was banished from the colony. The real issue was about predestination. Um, you know. If you say that, some people are saying maybe if you're doing, leading a good life outwardly, you have God's favor. And she said, no, you don't know that. And that could undermine the leadership in the colony. 
Eventually she said that she was getting messages directly from God, that was blasphemy. So she was banished from the colony. And today we're interested in the role of women and uh, read the transcripts. And Winthrop seemed to feel that uh, it was particularly galling to him that an intelligent woman, woman would be challenging him. So she went to um, Rhode Island, eventually Long Island, and was killed by Native people there. And she had one surviving child. And some of the descendants of that child include um, the Bush family. Um, John Kerry's a descendant of uh, Governor Winthrop. So uh, those two families ran against each other for president in 2004. It's not ancient history. Other descendants include Franklin Roosevelt and Mitt Romney. So it's quite a lineage. Woman on the left uh, was a follower of Ann Hutchinson, who became a Quaker. She was warned not to come back. She kept coming back into the colony. So she was hanged. I think she wanted to be a martyr. So the statue of those two women are in front of the state house to warn against um, religious intolerance. And that was an image that stayed with Massachusetts for quite a long time. Okay, next slide. I do want to go quickly. I know we're running out of time. Just very briefly, sometimes we talk about the American colonies as if they're just all the same. And there were regional differences. The Quakers settled Philadelphia. Uh, one a couple of differences, a study was done of them. And um, Dictionary of American Biography in the 19th century had many political leaders from Massachusetts, not too many from Pennsylvania. And that reflected maybe the Quaker idea of egalitarianism, you're not really seeking power. Another big difference was in literature. Many literary figures from Boston, not too many from Philadelphia. And that was because uh, they believed you should get up and speak sort of spontaneously. And um, maybe writing things down was a sign of personal vanity. So Quakers are admirable. They were, they were peaceful people. And many of them later became abolitionists. But just point out there's a little difference in their approach compared to the Puritans. Next one is Virginia, and that's an 18th century house. But I already quoted the governor of Virginia, Berkeley, and uh, he was saying, um, you know, he didn't want schools. Virginia was set up by Berkeley to mimic the class structure in England. In some cases, the younger children of the younger sons of aristocrats who were not going to inherit were invited to come over here. They would take their place at the top of society, and it was set up like a pyramid, and they brought large numbers of slaves to sort of play the role of peasants. So um, they were not as aware that in the long run, if you had a large number of slaves, you're creating problems for yourself. So that home is Westover. It's an 18th century building. William Byrd was a diarist, and you read his diary. It reflects the way they think. Uh, he said he was not too worried or troubled by religious papers. And he would talk about going to church and then coming home, visiting various women, committing uncleanness with them. And again, the idea that these people at the top have special privileges. So Virginia and Massachusetts, there are good things about Virginia. I don't have time to go all to all of them. But just making the point that the two colonies developed differently, not just because of climate, but because of a different philosophy. Finally, we have another group calling the border people, sometimes called the Scotch-Irish. We don't like to stereotype people based on, on their nationality. But these were people who lived on the border between England and Scotland. Some of them later went over to Ireland. And um, think about that situation. There are no schools open. There are no courts. There's warfare. You build a house, it gets torn down or destroyed. So people from that culture came later to America, tended to go into frontier areas. They were very democratic. They didn't want aristocrats. They wanted a strong man. And that is Andrew Jackson, who's sort of emblematic of that culture. And think about some issues like um, taking things to court. Even today, um, Obamacare, maybe New England's accepted. Some places in the South and West, they don't want the government intervening so much. Think of an issue like the control of guns, more accepted in Massachusetts, not so much in the South and West. And uh, you can see that these cultural patterns that went back to the 16th and 17th century actually affect our politics today to some extent. 
I know many people who come from this culture. They're not all running around with guns. They're not all against medical care. But when you think of politics nationally, this is an influence. So I'm going to conclude very quickly with the Greatest Hits album. Uh, that is the Scarlet Letter Law. You can see Nathaniel Hawthorne. If you look about two thirds of the way down, you can see the letter A for adultery. And you had to wear that uh, if you were convicted of that. Next, we have an uh, interesting looking document from the Salem Witch Trials era. It's an act against conjuration witchcraft and dealing with evil and wicked spirits. And it's actually progressive. They're no longer going to allow spectral evidence, you know, claiming that maybe someone's in jail, but her specter is in the room and sticking pins at me. So that's a sign of progress. And after the witch trials, they set up a new court and our Supreme Judicial Court traces its farming to that date. So the point we often make is sometimes injustice does lead to reform. Next slide is uh, just a little fun thing. I'm not sure the story is fun, but it's Captain Kidd. He was a real person. He was a pirate. He was arrested in Massachusetts. His wife wrote to the governor. She was a widow claiming that some of the loot that he had actually was hers and she wanted to correspond with him in jail. And eventually he was sent to England. He was hanged and his body was put out over the Thames River as a deterrent to piracy. Next, we have Beacon Hill um, with the charter. During the Puritan period, they received a letter from England saying they wanted the charter to be returned for examination. So they thought maybe the English would send a fleet to suppress the colony. So they ordered that a beacon be set on Sentry Hill, and if the fleet arrived, people would be warned. So that's the origin of the term Beacon Hill. And that was repeated again in the period before the revolution. Again, that's the place they would hang the beacon to warn of a possible attack. One more, it's kind of a fun thing, Beantown. This is a bit of speculation, but um, why is Boston called Beantown? It's thought maybe the Puritans baked beans on Saturday night, left them in the oven overnight, so they wouldn't have to work on Sunday. And uh, there were often bean suppers in uh, some of the rural areas of Massachusetts. I don't know if we can totally say that that's what it's about, but, but that's a theory where the name came from. So I wanna conclude by, uh, I've gone a little bit long, I'm sorry. I wanna conclude just by a couple of thoughts. In the 1990s, I was teaching American history course and I had a student from Russia. And when I mentioned the, uh, she, I got along with her personally, but not in the same wavelength. When we talked about the Bill of Rights, she was totally frustrated with that. She said, that's a gimmick, it wouldn't work anywhere. And there was a black student in the class who said, well, it, it's real, but it doesn't apply equally to everybody. And when you think about this period, we've talked about ideas going out about rights. There are some places in the world today still where people don't see the point of rights. And in America, we have these documents that we've accumulated going back to this period. We're not perfect, but people can point to them. And I think we have had progress. And I hope to make the point that you should not dismiss this period. You don't approve of everything that happened, but it perhaps did lay the foundation for later reform. So thanks for your attention. It went a little long, but I hope uh, we have the time for some questions. Just a few. It's Ron speaking. Uh, I see John, I don't hear his voice though. We have a question from Christopher Ramsey who says the location of the Plymouth Colony corn theft was that by any chance Corn Hill? Is that how it got its name? Do you have any idea about uh, that? No, it was out on Cape Cod further down. It was not in Plymouth itself. Mm -hmm. um, Nancy White wonders, did the Winslows bring a ward with them by the name of Christian Moore, Richard Moore? Uh, I don't know that. Off I the don't top. know that either. Um, Fred Meyer wants to know what was the hidden advantage of con co congregationalism? Why did it? Why? Why was it so important to us to be congregational? Uh, they were rebelling against the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church, and they did not want to be told what to do by bishops. Mm -hmm. So um, they wanted to have each congregation. Uh, picking their own minister and having some level of independence. There was some coordination. Uh, they occasionally had meetings. 
and uh, they came up with a document, the New England Way. But I think that was it. They wanted to get away from that hierarchy and get away from what they saw as artificial things that had been added by the churches and get back to the basic gospel. And again, they think it, think it may be promoted democracy. You know, if you can pick your own minister, uh, you can also pick your leaders. Um, there was also a, a, a chat question that came across about whether this has been recorded and whether it will be available for streaming. The answer is we are working on that. Um, we have all of the lectures from this year, plus what I did videos of the lectures last year, and we want to find a way to have probably a YouTube channel or something like that so that they can be available to anyone who wants to see them at any time. So keep, keep, keep looking. We'll find out the answer to that as best we possibly can. Thank you. Stephen Kenny, thank you so very much. That's, thank you. Uh, I that, the partnership has has profited from you so much and and stay with us and be well thank you we've got one last question coming in here let's see what this is um john anderson, yeah john it's hmm? i put one in for john anderson yeah um uh, can this, I? why the, 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 that's right there's a question why Fred Myers wonders why why Virginia didn't start a college at the same time as Massachusetts. That's that's a good question. Virginia did start a college soon after that, William and Mary, yeah. <clears throat> and it was for the elite. So Virginia had a college, but there wasn't the idea that you would teach everybody how to read. Yeah. You would educate an elite group, and they would go to William and Mary. Perhaps some of them would go to England to study. Good. That's the second college in America. A little different philosophy. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for participating with us. And we have another lecture coming up next week. And thank you, Arun Kylie, for your, your note that you, you, you tuning in from England and liking to learn about us. Thank you very much. When, uh, we're gonna uh, end it now. So good night, everybody, and see you around. Thank you. Thank you.